note, for maximum picture quality, it may be necessary to adjust the tracking control on your VCR. Hello and welcome to Adjust Your Tracking, a podcast where we're on an adventure to watch a century of cinema, decade by decade, year by year, and I am one of your hosts, Oliver Jones, and not with me is Liam, because Liam is busy at work, but with me I have... Hello, I am James Rayner. Hello, and how are you doing, my good sir? I'm in acceptable condition. <laughs> acceptable? <laughs> so you're not in prime condition, you No, I've been bare, but I, I'm in good talking condition well enough to talk about repo man today i think so yeah <laughs> so what you've been up to recently uh not a lot working uh watching movies uh had a lot more time on my hands recently so i've been able to get a lot more films watched which i'm quite happy about so living the dream yeah pretty much <laughs> Yeah, man, I've uh, I got stung by a massive um, import fee today. I'm not I'm not oh, shit. exactly happy. <laughs> On what? Uh, so I ordered. Um, it's basically like a camera rig for stop motion. Oh yeah. And you can also use it for like motion control stuff. And mm. Basically, you know, so it slides left to right, pan and tilts, and you know, focus pulls and all that kind of stuff. Really fancy piece of kit, but it came from Spain. And you know, like, I don't know, about four or five years ago, England decided to vote out of the EU because we're pricks. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's basically cost me £200 just to get into the country. <laughs> Jesus. Thank you. I have to be a lot more selective about where I order from now. Yeah. I mean, luckily, a lot of the places that I order from don't put the accurate uh, prices on the declaration forms on the front yeah, yeah so i might spend twenty dollars on a cd but they'll mark it as one dollar which is very helpful yeah, um, but then a lot of uh dvd companies you can get them on uh amazon uh now shipping from amazon us um uh and waiving shipping fees so you just have to pay like the import tax without right. the import fees so i've got a few titles that way i just ordered snake nice. eyes that way Brian De Palma movie. Ah, nice, nice. Yeah, nice. I, Good stuff. It's been out of print for years. I've been, it's been like 60 quid on eBay, but they re-released it at some point recently and nobody told me. <laughs> I haven't seen that one. Was it's that very around? Good. Was that around the time that he was doing like, not Brian De Palma, but like uh, Nicolas Cage was doing like 8mm and stuff like that? Was it around that uh, time? Yeah, in that vicinity. I think 8mm was a couple of years later. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm really interested to see his new film. It's called, I think it's Pig. called Pig. Yeah, and yeah. it's like, <laughs> it's, it sounds like a revenge film. Like, you know, like John... Uh, yeah, John Wick, John but with Wick, a pig instead of a dog. Pig. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I still need to watch Mandy. I've got that on DVD. Oh, I haven't watched it yet. Please watch Mandy. It's one of the, <laughs> like, I'm not even joking. Not a day has gone by since I first watched Mandy and I've not thought about Mandy. I don't know why. It's just one of those films that for me just has kind of, it's just imprinted on my brain. I've only seen it the once. I've listened to the score a lot, to be fair. Yeah. I love the score. I'm guessing you've heard the score. No, not yet. I, not? Just, uh, I feel like it's going to be one that I need to watch the film first before I listen to yeah. the score. I mean, I just adore that film. I know, like, yeah. for. You know, friends Brandon that who's been on this podcast quite a few times. He it didn't quite work for him, but uh don't know why. It just it just worked like gangbusters. There's a chainsaw fight in it. Two people yeah. have fights with chainsaws, <laughs> it's amazing. It is it's definitely one I'm dying to watch, but I, the conditions need to be right. Like it needs to be at a time when I'm not knackered, it needs to be dark, and I need to like have my headphones on, I need to sit down and watch it and pay attention to it yeah uh, and half the time it's i'm usually watching stuff in bright daylight in rooms with no curtains and things like that so i have to be very choosy with what i'm watching i feel that um mm. you saw the color from out space though didn't you yes i did yeah, yeah. And i really liked that although bad news about uh, richard stanley the director well what happened he's a woman beating scumbag oh no yeah one of those uh 
One of his ex uh, girlfriends wrote an open letter uh, about how he's just an abusive prick, and several other ex girlfriends came out and backed her up. Well, good on them though for coming. Yeah. For coming. For I them, wish I that had said that before I spent like thirty five quid on uh, the Dust Devil DVD. Yeah. <laughs> because I was going to say that though, because I think it's produced by the same production company, which I think is run by. Uh, oh, Spectre Vision. I think it's Elijah Wood is one of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I watched. Um, was it seventy eight fifty two? The uh, Psycho documentary about the uh, uh, the shower yeah. scene. Did they work and on that as well? They are in it uh, as oh, okay. talking heads, and uh, Morag, my wife, was in the room, and she was very confused why. Elijah Wood was getting interviewed about horror movies. I was like, "Well, this is this is his whole thing now. He's long gone of the Hobbit days, <laughs> and he's now fucking uh, William Lustig of the uh, of the new century." Well, I, I think he might be the villain in the new um, Toxic Avenger movie. I think. Uh, Kevin oh, no. Bacon. I know he's in it though, isn't he? He's definitely. In is it. he? I think so. But yeah, Kevin Bacon is the villain. He's mm-hmm. he always play ends up playing villains, is not he? Like. <laughs> the woodsman or oh, whatever <laughs> probably get his dick out as well at some point yeah. I tell you what I watched the other day I watched Tremors to go to sleep to the other day mm. that movie holds up like a motherfucker very much so. so like there's I don't think there's any there might be some miniature work in there but everything's practical and it just mm-hmm. nothing everything's hold, holds up about it in my opinion nothing looks dodgy or ropey it just there's one mat shot uh, in it? the uh, in the basement which doesn't hold up all, but everything else about it does. When Bert's base is it Bert? Yeah, it's yeah. over sh- over the shoulder shot of Bert uh, firing at the uh, at the miniature graboid, and uh, that's the only thing about it. I mean, they could have just kept it as it was. They did that cool like swish pan uh, off the when he throws the gun down, and then they swish pan over to the graboid. That was cutting between live action and a miniature, and they could have just kept it with that. But for some reason, they shoehorned a dodgy match shot in, and that's the only thing that lets it down. I think. I was going like down the the Wikipedia rabbit hole when I was watching that, and um, I didn't realize the woman who played his wife. She's like a massive country singer and has yeah, got, like, yeah. forty like albums and stuff like that. <laughs> she performs the song over the credits. Ah, is that her? That makes yeah. sense. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, have you watched all the sequels? Have you watched the new ones? Uh, I've only seen I've seen the second one, and I remember really liking that as a kid, but I haven't seen it since. Pff, I think I, I think me, Liam, and Rob watched it with speed on my 12th birthday or 13th birthday because mm. it was like a straight to video wasn't it yeah i remember renting it out um i've seen the third one maybe at liam's like on the sci-fi channel but i never saw the fourth one or the fifth one or the sixth one or the seventh <laughs> one of the tv show all the ones with um the original writers uh ss wilson and uh, brent maddock they're all very much worth watching they do suffer from like budget, like there's some dodgy CG in Tremors three, but then they've they got flying that, ones in there, haven't they? Yeah, yeah, ass blasters. <laughs> uh, but they uh, they listened to feedback they got on that, and they went back to uh, practical stuff on the fourth one. Um, but then they got basically booted out of the franchise, and the new ones, five, six, and seven, are above average for straight to video creature feature sequels, but they don't have the same like camaraderie as the other ones the other ones all continue the tone of the first one where it's all it's kind of upbeat and every it feels like a lived in world with all these characters that feel like real people and they become a bit more generic after that but they're still a good watch i heard that um ariana richards comes back in the third one I yeah, know, yeah i don't know how yeah, pretty like... much everyone comes back in the third oh, really? one yeah other than kevin bacon he did i uh, know he did... the weird thing is though he did the tv show that well, the pilot, didn't he? That didn't yeah. go anywhere. Well, um, at the time, he was really down on the film. Like he was, he was complaining to people on set about how his car- his career was over because he was working on this shitty monster movie out in oh. the desert. And for years, he wouldn't talk about it at all. And he'd come back to realize. I think when uh, 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 what's his name? When the author made uh, the Seeking Perfection unofficial guide to tremors book and he interviewed oh, yeah. everybody uh, i think that's when kevin bacon started to reevaluate it and went back and rewatched it and now he's fully on board with it again and he tried to get his own thing going which i was kind of annoyed by because michael gross 
are stuck with he's the franchise from the, the torch, beginning. And guys, yeah, he's, he's been keeping it going. And then Kevin Bacon comes in. He's like, nope, fuck you. I'm going to go do my own thing over here. So I was kind of glad when that got shit canned because uh, he didn't deserve it, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing shade at the bacon. Um, so what else have you been watching then? Uh, well, I watched um, the Psycho sequels. Um, i already seen Psycho 2, which I really like. I think is a, a lot better than it has any right to be. Uh, I watched Psycho 3 for the first time. Mm-hmm. which is also really good. Um, it's a bit schlockier than uh, the second one. Like, you hear conflicting things about the sequels, but either they were um, interfered with by the studio to make them more like slasher movies. Um, well, they obviously only brought the them crew. back because, like, you know... Because Hitchcock died. Hitch- <laughs> well, Hitchcock died, but also, you know... You it was had, barely like- in the ground when they started... Uh, talking about resurrecting but like because you had jason yeah like, i think jason i don't think freddy krueger would have been out by the time they did Psycho no not too, for the but, first one but they but, were yeah, definitely taking Texas chainsaw off. massacre and yeah. stuff like that and halloween so like that definitely must have inspired them to kind of mm. bring it back but, when they could yeah either either way they universal were either um forcing the sl- slasher tropes onto the films or they were shocked and appalled at the amount of violence and sex that became into the films that they couldn't continue with the franchise, depending on who you ask. Because Psycho 3 is very kind of slashery. There's a lot of gratuitous nudity and like strong violence. Uh, but according to what I've read, uh, it's directed by Anthony Perkins, and he wanted it to be a lot weirder and more sexual, and he wanted full frontal nudity in it. Um, <laughs> yeah, from uh, Jeff Fahey. Uh, of all people oh, okay. and it was only because he, he was uncomfortable with it he got to hold a lampshade in front of his cock which is a very funny shot I was considering like himself. screen grabbing it and putting it on my uh, Facebook profile as a header <laughs> image because it's very funny um, but yeah it's uh, it's an interesting film it's basically a love story with Norman Bates uh, falling in love with a, a new guest who reminds him of Marion Crane um, oh, okay. from the first one Um yeah, I've got the uh, the TV movie that they made in the 80s as a potential pilot for a series. Uh, I haven't watched that yet. And then uh, the Psycho 4, uh, the beginning to come as well. See, like, I've definitely seen one of these back in the day, one of the sequels, but I couldn't tell you which one I saw. I just remember it being in colour and obviously <laughs> not being the original one. I've, I mean, I've seen the original one, but uh, I've never seen the remake, actually, the Gus Van Sant one. No, I haven't seen that yet either. I'm quite interested to see that one one day. Yeah, I did see some clips from it somewhere. It might have been in that um, 7852 documentary. Yeah, I have got that to watch, so I'm looking forward to watching that. Mm. Yeah, it's a good watch. How is it like compared to, say, like you know, the Shining one? I didn't like the Shining one much. but um, uh, Room uh, 241, two, is it? Yeah, whatever it is. Yeah. I haven't seen that. I'm not a huge fan of the Shining. Uh, okay. Well, it, it's the way they present that film is quite... It's not my cup of tea. Basically, um, everything's edited to footage of a hitch of a, uh, a Kubrick film. So, like, say if it's like, oh, I'm going. I went to the cinema and I sat down with my popcorn. It's got clips of Tom Cruise from um, Eyes Wide Shut going oh, to right, the cinema yeah. and sitting down. But because it's kind of like they've got the footage, they've kind of got low res footage because it's the only one they're allowed to get like the rights to or some, you know, because you know mm. it's probably. Uh, fair use fair use yeah so you know they're probably you know they can only use the low rent low res footage of for that reason mm. but yeah, i remember just being bored by it <laughs> um what else have i been watching i got the new explorers blu-ray which has got a nice uh hour-long documentary on the making oh, nice. of that yeah it's the first one i've seen where the features of uh, uh well it's not the first one but it's the most in-depth one I've seen where the features have been produced during the pandemic. So, uh, like, all the interviewees are done over webcam. Uh, Did they get Ethan Hawke like back? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. He talks a lot about it and how he didn't even... He wasn't even auditioning. His mate was auditioning and they just saw him. Like It's like uh, in The Simpsons with the uh, Fallout Boy. They just saw him <laughs> out in the, in the uh, corridor and they're like, get that kid in here. But that happens a lot. I think like the key mm. plays short round in uh, 
It was either when he was, I think it was when he did Indiana Jones and it was like his brother auditioned and they're like, no, we want you instead. That's got to be like a proper shit film. <laughs> yeah. Sucks to be that kid. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, that's the major thing I've been uh, looking at. I watched a bunch of John Woo movies. Oh, yeah. His American ones, Hard Target, which I hadn't seen before, uh, which I liked. Um, was that his first um, one with John Claude Van Damme? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then uh, Broken Arrow, which I enjoyed a lot more than I thought I would. I'd seen it before, but not since it hit video. But it was ludicrously enjoyable. And Hans Zimmer, uh, with an interesting score for once. <laughs> hey, he's all right. <laughs> I know you've got your issues with him, but at least doesn't seem yeah. To yeah, mainly from the turn of the millennium. Is your issue mainly with him that he has other people he works with that kind of does a lot of work for him? Is that one of your big? No, it's there? just it's it's quite boring. <laughs> <laughs> like there's nothing memorable about any of his uh, scores after the millennium. I don't think. Well, the Dark Knight Inception may beg to differ. He wrote a fucking Batman theme that's two notes. Shut up. It's good. I like it. Wow. That doesn't do that. Two, that's two notes not... is... <laughs> Listen to it and I guarantee you it doesn't do that. And also, don't forget, don't forget, James Newton Howard wrote on two of those as well. Yeah. So, like, it's a collaboration between the two of them. But yeah, he, uh, he was a lot more interesting in the nineties with his. Uh... He's a lot cheesier for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they reused uh, the theme from Broken Arrow um, in Scream Two for oh, yeah. um, Dewey's theme. Which is oh, weird down, because down, it's, down, it's, down. yeah, it's down, 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 down. in the film. It's John Travolta's theme who's the bad guy. Where it's this <laughs> really cool heroes. kind of yeah, it's a really cool kind of twangy like Western heroes theme. Um, and then they use it for some goofy prick in Scream Two. It was, makes no sense as uh, musical consistency. Oh, you, but, yeah. you rewatched Fargo, didn't you? I did. Yeah. And how do, and how do you feel? Does it hold up in your estimation? It does. It's. It's basically a comedy, but it keeps getting billed as a thriller. But yeah. it's so upbeat, and all the characters are so upbeat. It's, I mean, it only... It's, it's amazing. Oh, it's one of my uh, favourite films of all time. It is really good. Like, just some of the... Just some of the little parts. Like, you've kind of got, like, the little subplot of where she goes out on a date with... With an old school buddy old school or college buddy. buddy. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you're like... And it just it doesn't go anywhere, but it just kind of it, but it feels right in that film. Mm. You know what I mean? And um, like just that ending when they put the body in the chipper is just like and the fact that he's just wearing like long johns and he's like <laughs> yeah. he puts them. he puts his hat on first before he yeah, comes he out to murder <laughs> Steve Buscemi. Um, but yeah, William H Macy as well. He's such a weaselly little prick. Uh, everyone's on fire in that film, and like yeah. the fact that she doesn't come into that film until about forty minutes into it. Yeah, and she just owns that film. But... Yeah, my I think my favorite part is uh, William H Macy screaming as he's arrested, and he tries to climb out the window <laughs> in the in the room at the end. He's just like, ah, no, no, wait, no, 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 have you watched the uh, TV series? No, uh, it's been on my list, but you know, it's uh, I very rarely commit to a TV series. It, it is good. Like the first one, de- like has definite has massive callbacks to the uh, to the film. It's got like a subplot mm. that kind of links into the film. Um. And I think thematically it's the most like the Fargo itself and like where the other series, they kind of drift off into almost like it's the Coen Brothers TV series as opposed to just Fargo. Mm. So like... um, I remember seeing the trailers and thinking it looked kind of like Fargo meets No Country for Old Men. Yeah, there's definitely like, especially in the second series, there's a character that's a lot more like, is it Sugar... 
Sugar, I can't remember his name. Mm. You know, um, Javier Bardem's character and stuff. Like, you kind of got more people like that. You, you've kind of got like, you know, uh, the man who is it the man who wasn't there? Yeah, the with Billy Bob Thornton. They've kind of got mm-hmm. a bit of that in there as well. Uh, they've got they have a lot of subplots that kind of don't go anywhere, but mm. that's I think that's very typical of like the Coen Brothers as well. Yeah, and then that was a big criticism about the Big Lebowski is it's a film where nothing happens. Well, that's yeah, but that's what's brilliant about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I've watched a bunch of stuff too. Would you like mm. me to talk to you about them? I would enjoy that very much. Like brilliant, I shall <laughs> proceed. Um, so, for some reason, I don't know why, I've watched the Brady Bunch movie. <laughs> from, <laughs> I've, I've, I've heard that's really good. From 95, directed by mm. Betty Thomas, uh, who I think she directed Private Parts as well. Yeah, I think so. Which, when I was a kid, I loved Private Parts, because it's got a lot of <laughs> boobs in it. <laughs> but I have a feeling, if I was to watch it now, I think Howard Stern is quite a pretty... I don't know. He's not a person I probably mm. would uh, like to meet. <laughs> the, the fact that he plays himself in it, I'll probably yeah. it probably wouldn't work for me anymore. But um, but yeah, I quite like the Brady Bunch movie. You've got Gary. Is it Gary Cole? Yeah. I think yeah. from Office Space. You know, Bill. L- is it Lundergaard? I forgot. It. No. It's been a long time since I watched you know, Office Space. Anyway, the manager from Office Space. Mm. Uh, Shelley Long is it? I think. Mm-hmm. From Cheers. Cheers. Michael McKean. He was you know Spinal Tap. Uh, Christine Taylor, who's been in loads of like comedy films and stuff, uh, and then the one I was like, the one who plays Greg, the older brother. I was like, I know that voice. Where do I know that voice from? And it hit me. It was the voice of Spider Man from the cartoon series in the nineties, and that's <laughs> Christopher Daniel Barnes. And I was like, it's Spider Man. And also, <laughs> you've got um, RuPaul pops up in it as the uh, the school counselor. I think her name's Mrs. Cummings. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got uh, the guy who plays Tackleberry from um, oh, yeah. Police Academy. I've, I've heard a lot of good things about both of them. Uh, a very Brady sequel as well. There's a third one as well, like the White. They go to the White House. Really? Yeah, and the only people who carry on from it is Gary Cole and Shelley Long playing mm. the. You know the. the, the I imagine uh, all the kids will kind of age out of it at that point. Yeah, I think I think they keep the same cast though for the second one. Mm. But I like what they did. You know, they kind of. Kept them in the seventies, mm. the sixties, or whatever it was, and then, but they're in the nineties, so it's all about that kind of fish out of water kind of stuff. But they're kind of oblivious to it all. It's not <laughs> like, you know, when you see like a film, like you know, time traveling film, or whatever, and mm. they're kind of like in the present day or in the past or whatever, and they're kind of like not sure what's going on. Like they just, they just ignored all progress. Yeah, they just carry on with life. <laughs> um, and also, it's kind of got a weird connection to to the film we're going to talk about today. So we haven't said it yet, but we're going to talk about Repo Man, Alex Cox's film from 1984. Mm. But in the Brady Bunch movie, the monkeys make a cameo. Yeah. And the only member of the monkeys not present in the film is Michael uh, Nesmith, or whatever his name is. Yeah. But he produced Repo Man, and he was also in the monkeys. He was also in Repo Man. Oh, he was as well. Yeah, he was. Yeah. He had a. Was he? Who was he in that? Was he the uh, the preacher on the preacher. TV? Yeah, yeah, the evangelical guy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this film, like, it was written by Bonnie Turner and Terry Turner, who were like a wife and Wayne's World, and they did Don't Wayne's they World yeah. and Tommy Boy, and I think Third Rock from the Sun, and you can really tell, like, their sense of humor is like stamped all over these films. Um, also, like, there's a battle of the bands in it. Like, the the, part of the plot is pretty simple. Basically, the Bradys haven't paid a tax bill and they owe $20,000. And uh, they're all kind of coming up with ways of how they can make $20,000. But there just so happens to be a battle of the bands. The, the prize money is $20,000. Well, it was the 90s. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but then this has got, like, a bit of a chain reaction. All the films I've watched over the last few days or weeks they kind of all link into each other somehow so like i couldn't sleep the other night because it was really hot so uh, i was flipping through netflix and um you know like a little preview of like what you're gonna watch Mm. and i was scrolling through and then i hovered over school of rock and i haven't watched that since it came out Mm. and it was the scene like the preview was the scene where he's playing his his song to the kids but he's not playing it on guitar or whatever he's like doing it all Mm. you know and uh, (laughs) i was like 
I'm watching it now. So at like about one in the morning, I put School of Rock on and just mm. watched it till the end. I, that film is it works so well. Like yeah. I don't think Jack Black has ever been better on screen. It was like perfect for him. Like I, well, I think it was tailor made for him. Mm. Yeah, I uh, I watched uh, a bit of it recently, uh, flicking through TV channels, and it was on Sky. And uh, I had my eighteen-month-old uh, daughter with me, uh, yeah. sat on my knee, and it was the scene where he uh, distributes all the instruments to the kids when they come back from music class. He's uh, handing oh, yeah. the bit, bass guitar to the cello player and all that kind of stuff, and she was hooked. Like she really? stopped, yeah. She was sat on my knee and she just stopped moving. She was just staring at the TV, watching these events unfold, which she very rarely does. She'll watch it for a few seconds and then get bored. But she was hooked for the, like the full seven minute scene. So yeah, it's, I'm gonna it's... set her up with some tenacious D at some yeah, point. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, but like Mike White, who wrote this, like I, I quite like the other films he's done. So he did Orange County, which is I think Harold Ramis cameos in that, doesn't he? As like the dean. Um, he also yeah, and he gets he accidentally takes drugs, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, that's a great scene, that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which if you've read uh, the book about Harold Ramis, his uh, his daughter wrote is quite funny thinking back the thing oh, yeah. <laughs> accidentally taking drugs. As opposed to just full on just taking them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just fucking off to an island somewhere and taking drugs for <laughs> exclusively. I feel so good. I need to lie down. Hey, uh, before you do that, uh... Sean, you're my same height. That is neat. Um, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, so Mike White also did uh, Nacho Libre, which is a film I didn't like at first, but it, it grew on me a lot. And then one of my favourites of his that I don't think anyone else has seen that I know is called Gentleman Broncos. I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it. And I love that film. Basically, it's about a young kid who um, writes a short story. And he goes to this writing camp, and his favourite writer, played by um, Jermaine Clements from the Flight of the Concords, mm. is kind of like the kind of like the mentor there. But he's going through writer's block. And while he's like reading through all the, the books that the kids have been submitting, just, you know, so he can help guide their stories and stuff. He basically steals this kid's story called Yeast Wars. And you see the story from both of their point of view. So, like, you see the kid's version and you see the version that uh, Jermaine Clements has kind of rewritten just to kind of be a bit more in his style. Mm. And uh, Sam Rockwell plays both the main character. And uh, it's so funny, man. Like, they're just... <laughs> when did that come out? Oh, uh, probably about 10 years ago, maybe. Yeah. Honestly, like it's a lot of testicle humour. It's, it's it's great. <laughs> Sold. Yeah, I think he's I think his nads get taken out. Like the char- in the book, his character his nads get taken, he's on a quest to get his nads back, basically. <laughs> but it's like this weird, like sci fi trippy sci fi thing. But then within the film, the young boy who writes a book, he ma- ma- meets some like young filmmakers who option his book mm. and then make his book into a, a film so you then see like a kind of like um what were those films like in uh, going back to jack black again you know be kind rewind where they kind of made like uh what do they call them sweded sweded films it was like a sweded version of this sci-fi fantasy thing but yeah really were anyway i didn't watch that film but anyway i recommend <laughs> that film i really liked it um what else did I watch? Oh, yeah, School of Rock. I didn't realise. Obviously, it's got a, a Broadway show, but it's got like a TV show as well that ran for like a couple of years. Wasn't it like a reality show or something? No, I think it was like an actual like sitcom. All right. You know, like on Nickelodeon or something like that. I was completely unaware of that. Oh, I forgot to mention, you know, I was saying about the $20,000 Battle of the Bands in Brady Bunch movie. Mm-hmm. In School of Rock, there's also a Battle of the Bands in that. Mm-hmm. And the prize money is twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> um, and then you know I've got my list of films. Yes, I got the impression Repo Man was on that list. No, I actually thought I owned Repo Man. I spent a good half an hour looking for the DVD of Repo Man, and then realised, oh, I don't actually own Repo Man. <laughs> so last week we were lucky enough to have two of the members of the Film Junk podcast, which. If you didn't know, is my favourite podcast. I've been listening to it for like 13 years. So having them on was like pretty incredible. Mm. And like, I'm not, 
I don't get like nervous or awkward around famous people, and you know, I've been around my fair share of famous people. You know, uh, Jasper Carrot to name <laughs> <laughs> uh, the prodigy. I've been in a room with like Christopher Nolan, name drop clank. I didn't speak to him, but um, and, you know, like uh, you know, I've interviewed Black Sabbath and stuff like that. One of my favorite bands, and like. I wasn't nervous in the slightest. It could be because I was in work mode, so you know you kind of have mm. to put your professional face on or whatever. But um, I was really nervous to speak to these guys because you know I listen to them every week, and mm. um, I'm not going to lie. I had to re-record some of my bits because I was proper like. <laughs> 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 and so if you ever hear like if you listen to it, and all of a sudden my tone of voice suddenly shifts. It's because I've re-recorded a few little bits, so I didn't sound like a complete brick. But anyway, so I, I let them pick a number each. So, you know, it meant I had to watch two films extra this week. All right. So um, I think uh, Sean picked Short Term 12, which is from 2013, directed by uh, Destin Daniel Creton. I don't, I don't know what Creton Creton. I don't. Sounds a bit of a dodgy know. surname. <laughs> but yeah, he's now gone on to direct Shang Chi for Marvel Studios now. Yeah. And uh, because I'm a lazy fuck, I didn't even watch the Blu-ray, which is the whole point of this. I found out it was on Amazon Prime and watched it on there. <laughs> so yeah, the film stars um, Brie Larson from I don't know like Scott Pilgrim and all that. I think it was her first leading role. Um, and basically, it follows a group of young 20-somethings who work as supervisors in a foster home for, like, troubled teenagers. And throughout the course of the film, uh, while having to deal with the the problems of the youngsters, she's also coming to terms with her own past as well. And I thought it was a really well-made, like, uh, indie drama. Yeah, it also stars uh, John Gallagher Jr., uh, Caitlin Denver, uh, Romy Malik in one of his earlier films, you know, the guy who played... Um, uh, Freddie Mercury. Mm. And then I also thought Keith Stanfield was really good in the film as well. He plays a character called Marcus, who's one of the troubled teenagers. And throughout the film, you have two characters, one who's just about to join the um, the foster home and another one who's about to leave and um, and how they're probably worried about kind of going out into the open world, becoming an adult and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like, I don't really want to spoil the plot or anything, but it's just a really uh, well-made little drama with, you know, some nice little bits of comedy thrown in and a lot of truth and, yeah. you know, it's filmed very honestly. And, I mean, like, I, I don't know how much in-depth I want to get onto it, but I, it really worked for me. I thought it was a really well-made, like, little indie film. You know, it's got a nice tight 90-minute yeah. uh, runtime. Yeah, I really liked it. Um yeah, yeah, I saw it quoted a lot when uh, Brie Larson started breaking out with uh, her room. <clears throat> like people were going back to that one. Yeah, it was. I think it was a few years before that, but it was definitely like one of her breakthrough films. Like, mm. you know, unfairly, I think a lot of people have turned on her recently. I know she was she was in you know the well the fucking nerdlingers on Twitter have turned on her because they think. Well, first of all, she they got mad because she said she wanted to speak to more people of colour on the Captain Marvel uh, press junket. So now everyone's like, she hates white people! Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then the same people who think Kathleen Kennedy is ruining Star Wars have lumped oh, her okay. in. Because now every report is, Kathleen Kennedy does this other thing that uh, breaks Star Wars in half. And also, Brie Larson is going to be in Star Wars. So they've kind of attached her to the same uh, angry screeds that they've got against Kathleen Kennedy. They're such weirdos. <laughs> like, you know, everything I've seen her in, I think she's pretty pretty yeah. good in. I mean, like, I watched Captain Marvel and she was pretty bland in that, but I don't blame her for that. I blame mm. the, the screenwriting and directing. I mean, she is meant to be quite bland. I mean, that she's got no memory for most of the film and she exactly, only gets it back yes, in the last exactly, half hour. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, she's great in Scott Pilgrim. Mm. And everyone's super happy now that her version of uh, Black Sheep Metric song has come out, I think. I'm not fucking happy because it's only on vinyl. <laughs> Digital. Hello again, friend of a friend. I knew you were. I Is it not even on Spotify or whatever? Yeah, it's on Spotify, but fuck Spotify. I want a CD. <laughs> 
fair enough. It's quite pricey as well, the vinyl, I think. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Fuck vinyl in all of its forms. <laughs> oh, yeah, but she has got a gaming channel, and I watched a bit of that, and that does reek of a bit of desperation. It's not very good. But, <laughs> but then again, going back to Jack Black, he's got a gaming channel called Jabroski or something like that, and the whole <laughs> shtick of that is that he does no gaming on it whatsoever. <laughs> I haven't seen any of his gaming channel, but he posts very entertaining uh, Instagram videos. Yeah. I don't know what he's got going on, but he's got some weird like effects package. So there's this one I remember is this very elaborate kind of steady cam shot going around his uh, his back garden, which is huge with a huge swimming pool in it. And there's all these various like frozen versions of himself floating around in the background. And he just keeps kind of jumping into the frozen pose, becoming that pose, and then going further around <laughs> to the next pose. It's very well done for an Instagram video. Uh, he keeps posting weird stuff like that. Good on you, Jack Black. Um, yeah. Then the other film that was picked was The Phantom of the Opera, which I thought it was the Lon Chaney version, which I think was from like 1928. But no, this hmm. is like the Arthur Lubin version. Yeah. And it's in colour, and it's got Claude Rains as the Phantom. Not the Robert England version. <laughs> no, or the... Uh, <laughs> I think Gerald Butler played one, I think, in the... Uh, I think that was based on the Andrew Lloyd Webber musical version. Yeah. But, um, I mean, it was okay. I mean, I didn't think it was that great. Uh, <laughs> it's definitely, like, an early colour film. Mm. And, you know, it has that weird, like, colour banding, you know, where it kind of almost looks like it's kind of got, like, the RGB split where you kind of see a bit of the mm. red and the green on the sides and stuff, and... Which I, I don't dislike that look. I think it looks kind of quite cool. But um... Yeah, I saw um, Warner Archive have just put out a Blu-ray of a film called The Wax Museum, I think. Oh, yeah. Which was another very early f- colour film, um, which I think could only pick up certain colours. So it's lit in a very, almost Argento style, mm. like very harsh greens and reds and things, which looks pretty cool. Um, I was thinking of uh, picking that up just for that. Right. It's one of these old ones that's like shot on nitrate film as well, so you know it's going to burst into flames at any point. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if this like <laughs> like the emerald greens that proper emerald green like his mm. mask instead of like being white or whatever is like a, an emerald green and mm. But like I I kind of enjoyed it. It kind of washed over me a little bit because the plot's very simple. It's like uh Claude Rains plays a, a violinist in an opera. It, it basically I think he's just getting older and he's got like arthritis in his hand, so he gets fired. But he's been putting all his money into this young singer that he kind of thinks is amazing. And she, he's like paying secretly to have, for her to have singing lessons and stuff like that. She's not even questioning who's paying <laughs> for these lessons for her. But then she's got two of the guys, like a police officer or police chief, and then the lead guy in the opera who are both are fighting for her affections. Um, so in order to make some money, he sells like one of his concertos at a publisher's but he never hears back from the publishers, so he goes back there and he overhears someone playing his music and then he thinks it's being stolen and then he kills someone. But like it's proper PG kind of horror, so instead of mm. like actually strangling them, he's just putting his hands on their shoulders and then they're, like, <laughs> they're dead. And you're like, oh, okay. Um, then he gets, for some reason, they've got acid on a tray and um, this woman just throws a tray of acid at his face and... Uh, he screams and then runs and hides in the sewer and then like makes his way back to the opera where he kind of disguises himself with a cloak and a mask. <laughs> and then uh, he tries to kind of help this woman's career, the one that he paid for the singing lessons by, like trying to kill off all the people who, like the the main female lead in the opera, so then she can like take the place as the the main actress and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was okay. <laughs> When it comes to Phantom of the Opera, I either think of Phantom of the Paradise mm-hmm. or Gremlins 2. Oh, yeah. Yeah, where they, uh, they're in the lab and the Gremlin just picks up a beaker off the shelf which says, Danger, Acid, Do Not Throw in Face on the label. <laughs> and then he throws it in the Gremlin's face. All right, so um, as you're today's guest, you've got to pick a number between... Uh, what have I got? Between 1 and 182. Hmm. 76? 76. What's that? Heart of Glass. That sounds familiar. Oh, it's a, 
It's a Werner Herzog film. It's on my. It's on my Herner. Uh, Herner. <laughs> Werner Herzog <laughs> box set. We've seen he's pretty much a regular on The Simpsons now. Who Werner? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's been in like five episodes I've watched recently. Is it real Werner or is he like Paul? No, it's him. Is it actually? <laughs> yeah, he had a good Ghostbusters joke in a recent one. He was playing like a fortune teller and. Uh, Everyone else asks questions about their future, and Homer goes, uh, how many more Ghostbusters movies are they going to make? And he goes, six. The gay Ghostbusters is fantastic. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> um, I was going to say, other than that, I watched In the Heights, which is like the new, well, I say new, but it's, it predates uh, Hamilton, but it's the Lin-Manuel Miranda mm. musical. More I went to see that the other day. Uh, I really liked it. I'll probably talk about it more with... Liam once Liam mm. seen it, but yeah, I really liked it. It's set over three days uh, during, like I think, the two thousand three blackout. That like takes that. That's a big part of the story, and it's set largely in like a Dominican uh, neighborhood, and follows like one guy as he battles with whether or not he should leave uh, New York or not. But yeah, I liked it. Um, and then I watched. Have you seen Hamilton? Yeah, I actually really really like Hamilton. Have you seen it? No. It's good. Like The music's pretty ace, and uh, I'm seeing it next year. We bought, well, uh, we got tickets for Caroline's birthday, so because she's obsessed mm. with it. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing that in, in person. We've had tickets for Book of Mormon for about three years now. Well, I had tickets because it, it was on tour. Mm. I mean, I've seen it already. I saw it, I saw it in New York. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> It's all right. You saw the Ghostbusters firehouse without yeah. scaffolding covering the whole entire building. Wop wop. And I saw the uh, the show at Universal Studios. Oh, I saw that when I was a kid. Oh, fuck you. I've got it on video. I've got it on, like on. It's on YouTube, isn't it? Yeah, but um, what was I saying? Uh, in the Heights. Hamilton, oh yeah, yeah. no, uh, yeah, uh, Book of Mormon. Yeah, we we had tickets to see it. Cause it was on tour around the UK, but I think we were going to see it like the week of lockdown. Yeah, Starting. we had tickets for last April, and um, they literally cancelled the whole thing. So we had to, we just mm. got our money back. Like they didn't even reschedule it; they just cancelled it out. Ours are still on hold. I oh, think really? they're scheduled for next year now. So yeah, I'm hoping to see it again because I, mm. I really enjoy. It. Have you have you ever have you even listened to it? No, I don't want to listen to it until I've seen it. Uh, it is really good. I he- I heard they're gonna they're talking about rewriting a little bit of it. I don't know if that'll affect the viewing you see, but I think they want to make it a bit more. I don't want to say it's racist. I don't know. I, don't, I mean, I'm not the person who can comment on that, really. But mm. I think they want to make it a bit more. Well, I think they do that kind of thing. You know, if quite if, a lot with live, uh, like theatre. Yeah, I mean, you. I can mean, it's not. Do that. It's not a, a typical example, but Evil Dead the musical. I've yeah. got a bootleg of it, which is one version of it. But the soundtrack uh, version and the version that's currently playing is uh, a lot different. The entire third act is uh, entirely different from right. this bootleg that I've got. I found out this week, I haven't watched it, I'll say that now, but I found out there was an <laughs> Evil Dead porn parody called Evil Head. Oh, yeah. <laughs> By the makers of Repenetrator, I believe. Repenetrator. <laughs> I've seen Repenetrator, I haven't seen Evil Head. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> should, we, um, should we get into today's film then? Yeah, yeah. All right, so uh, well, I'll let you introduce it. So, as as James is our guest, I let James pick the film we we're going to watch today. So, what did you pick then, James? Uh, I picked uh, Repo Man, uh, nineteen eighty four, directed by Alex Cox, starring uh, Harry Dean Stanton and uh, Emilio Estevez. A very young Emilio Estevez. Yeah, yeah. I imagine this is one of his first films. All right, let's listen to that trailer. Boom. What you got in the trunk? You don't want to look in there. Suppose you're thinking about a plate of shrimp. Suddenly somebody will say like plate or shrimp or plate of shrimp out of the blue, no explanation. No point in looking for one either. It's all part of a cosmic unconsciousness. You eat a lot of acid, Miller, back in the hippie days? Sell that car and send me your money. 
You don't need that car. Put it on a plate, son. You'll enjoy it more. Couldn't enjoy it anymore, Mom. Mm -mm -mm. This is swell. What's this? <laughs> Charming friends you got there, Otto. Thanks. I made it myself. I had a lobotomy in the end. Lobotomy? Isn't that for loonies? Not at all. A friend of mine had one. I do my best thinking on the bus. That's how come I don't drive, see? You don't even know how to drive. I don't want to know how. I don't want to learn, see? The more you drive, the less intelligent you are. Okay, so there's kind of two plots that kind of intertwine in this film. So you've kind of got plot A is a guy being chased by the government or, you know, the feds or the police. And he's kind of, he's in this uh, 64 uh, Chevrolet Malibu. I've never heard a car name said so many times in a film. <laughs> and he's kind of got something in the trunk of his car. We're not quite sure what's in the car because you never see it. But there's kind of references to that maybe it's to do with the Manhattan Project or, you know, or Roswell, something alien. But yeah, everyone's after this car because the other plot is that uh, Emilio Estevez is a young guy. He doesn't kind of fit in with society. Um, and he befriend, well, he meets Harry Dean Stanton, who kind of convinces him to take this car. And it turns out he's actually stealing a car. But he's not actually stealing a car because Harry Dean Stanton is a repo man. So he's basically, by chance, Emilio Estevez becomes a repo man. And then one of the cars they have to go after is this 64 Chevro, Chevrolet Malibu. And so they're basically kind of tracking this car down. Uh, is that kind of a rough? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's all the plot. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, I think it's it's the plot is quite thin. Mm. But I think um, it's got a really interesting world. And it's got a really cool mix of tones and styles. Like you think mm. it's quite a trashy science fiction comedy film. But... Well, I got to say, like I, the stuff with the in the uh, in the trunk of the car. For some reason, I thought it was more kind of class of Newcomb High, Toxic Avenger type radiation type thing going on, rather than the aliens and UFO stuff that ends yeah. up being a, a strong suggestion. I wasn't expecting any of that sci-fi stuff. I thought it was. Some kind of radioactive gunk or yeah. material. I mean, but, it could um, be both, really. I mean, the car yeah. ends up like glowing radioactive green at the end, and, <laughs> and, but then it flies off. So it's a bit of both, really. Mm. But yeah, as I was saying, like, so you think it's this trashy science fiction comedy, but like, it's very, um, it's very much a commentary on like American suburban life and like the Reagan era mm. of America, like of the early eighties and. Um, it's very satirical, isn't it? Which is uh, interesting since Alex Cox is British. Yeah, exactly. But it's about, I guess, how the British, how uh, someone, an outsider, sees America, I guess, mm. maybe. You know, like, if you look at, like, all the products in the shops and stuff like that, it's all this kind of generic. All generic, yeah. So, like, it, instead of saying beer, it'll just say, like, alcohol or... You drink. Drink or something like that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it looks almost like Happy Shopper kind of stuff. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. like the, or, you know, you, you've got like the stuff in Tesco, like Tesco is like... Yeah, Tesco value. Cheap range or whatever, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know about you, but I definitely felt like Tarantino is influenced by this film massively. Yeah. Like, even though this film is like made by like a boomer, I guess, uh, you know, that era, it feels more like a Gen X kind of film, like, you know, like Tarantino's work, like in Reservoir Dogs and uh, Pulp Fiction and stuff like that. You know, the film follows a character who doesn't quite know what he wants to do with his life and he's kind of figuring it out, bumbling his way through life and he kind of 
just finds a job through happenstance and you know there's lots of references to kind of pop culture and counterculture yeah so yeah i definitely think it's in that gen x wheelhouse like for example like when at the beginning of the film when the guy he's driving the uh the chevrolet and he's being chased by the police and he pulls over and you know the police want to see what's in the back of his trunk and they open it up it's kind of like, you know, the Marcellus Wallace opening up the, the, uh, the briefcase and stuff. Mm. It's just glowing. I mean, obviously, Marcellus Wallace or whoever, I can't remember, in Pulp Fiction. Didn't disintegrate. They didn't disintegrate, but kind of skeleton. <laughs> and then, like, I love that. Whenever they show boots and it's just, like, <laughs> smoking feet or whatever. But, um, like, I definitely think he took that. But also, like, I mean, this this scene later on in the film, I think now does not play very well. But there's a scene where they talk about John Wayne. And there's a lot of, like... Mm. horrible words used that we won't <laughs> mention now but it does feel like a scene that could have been like in Reservoir Dogs or something you know like how they talk about like Madonna like a virgin and stuff like that mm. but in this they kind of they talk about how they say that, that John Wayne was secretly you know a gay man yeah. you know they, they don't use is... words like that but, uh, mm. but do you know what I mean it's kind it of it is a funny those... story that he tells yeah it is uh, the way to but, do you know um, who tells that story go on he plays Bob the Goon in um Batman 89. Yeah, I was looking him up because he looked really familiar. I thought it was Fisher Stevens initially, but then... No, it's not Fisher Stevens. He's a bit too old for that, but um, yeah, I'm it's sure not. I've seen him in something else. It's not Batman. I haven't seen that in years, but... Oh, um, I watch that quite often. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, uh, I really liked him as an actor. What's his name? Uh, Tracy Walter. Tracy Walter, yeah. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> Alex Cox is quite an interesting fellow. Like, if you... If you kind of look at his career, mm. like as you said, he's like a a British guy that kind of moved to America and started making films over there. And I think this film is kind of like, like I think he was a repo man for some time. So mm. some of it is loosely autobiographical, I guess. <laughs> well, the um, the John Wayne story was uh, something that somebody had told him. Told, uh, Alex Cox. I told Alex Cox. Yeah. If, if you look at Alex Cox's career, though, like... Uh, so he went from this film, and then the next film I think he did was um, Sid and Nancy. Sid and Nancy, yeah. Which again kind of explores the punk rock world that's kind of mm. a good portion of this film. Um, yeah, it's a good soundtrack. I love Sid and Nancy. I don't know if you've seen it. I haven't. It's another one that's on my list. I mean, but I again, I haven't. To... Again, it's one of those films I haven't seen in a long time, but I remember like really liking it when I was younger. You know, because I was into the punk scene and stuff. I wasn't really oh. into that kind of punk. I was more into skater punk. But, you know, it's all in the same wheelhouse. Mm. So, yeah, after Sid and Nancy, he did uh, Straight to Hell, which I think is like a it's like a film starring a lot of musicians. Mm. I think like Courtney Love's in it, Joe Strummer, Elvis Costello, and people like that. And then after that, he did Walker, which uh, is like a, an American Spanish historical satirical film. It's got Ed Harris in it. Um, but after that, he kind of like steered his uh, career towards more independent films. I do think he was actually attached originally to direct or at least write Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. But um, mm. I think once Terry Gilliam came involved, he kind of completely like rewrote his script. But I think he's got a credit, though. But like it feels like he never had the same success after that again. Like mm. He seems like a guy that's determined to go against the grain. And, like, if you look at, like, the budgets of all of his films, it's like, no, I want less money for my next film. I want <laughs> less, I want less, I want less. And, like, you get to a point where he's actually made a sequel to this film, like, about ten years ago. And it's called Repo Chick. Mm. And it's, like, all on green screen. And I'm not mocking anything on green screen because I've done a lot of work on, like, green screen and stuff. Yeah. But it looked really shoddy. Like, last week we talked about Streets of Fire. I don't know if you've seen Streets of Fire. No. But I think you will actually really enjoy Streets of Fire. Um, they did a sequel to Streets of Fire that was all on green screen and cheap as fuck. This is the same thing. Yeah, I think um, Richard Elfman is doing a Forbidden Zone sequel all on green screen. Okay. I mean, look, you can totally do green screen well. I mean, mm. you know, like I know a lot of people don't like uh, Zack Snyder or whatever, but he's good at doing, you know, he makes it look cinematic. You know, Rob Rodriguez, Robert Rodriguez did an amazing mm. job with like Sin City. Maybe not so much the second one, but... I um, liked the second one. I fell asleep during it, so I, <laughs> I can't really. Um, aside from like the gender swap of the character, I think instead of going after a car in this film, they're actually going after a uh, 
a, a train of all things. <laughs> but yeah, then he also did a comic book as well called uh, Waldo's Hawaiian Holiday. I don't know what it's called, Waldo. I don't know if that's like a copyright thing because mm. when he did the sequel, Repo Chick, I think uh, Columbia tried to sue him mm. because they own the rights to Repo Man, which apparently is one of the reasons why they may have called Repo Men Repo Men as a bit of a stab, like getting back at him. Mm. Because everyone thought, oh, is this a sequel to Repo Man? Repo Men, anyway. Uh, so yeah, well, com- actually, it was a rip-off of uh, Repo, the genetic opera. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah. Uh, okay. It was all about uh, repossessing transplanted organs, which is uh, what Repo, the genetic opera, is about. Ah, uh, interesting. But on a much lower budget and with songs. But yeah, there's a, a comic book called Waldo's Hawaiian Holiday. So I don't know if Waldo is meant to be Otto and they j- changed his name for like mm. legal reasons or whatever. I don't, I don't know. But I mean, the actual artwork's pretty good. It looks a lot better than Repo Chick, the <laughs> the film. I didn't um, look too deeply into Repo Chick, but I've got an, uh, an idea of what it might look like. I think the key is to green screen films, which is where all these low budget ones fall down, is with sound. Oh, they yeah, all definitely. sound like the shot in a studio with yeah. an onboard mic rather than having any kind of proper sound mix on them. Well, whenever I've done it, I tend to ADR it. So, mm. or, you know, film record the audio in like a location that would be suitable for where your, yeah. your fake background is or whatever. And they, t- they tend to just put really bad images behind them or like mm. they don't, you know, it's a, you know, it's a compositing job. You have to put layers and stuff like that. You have to put filters on the front ambience behind it, lighting. Mm. You know, you have to think about a lot to make it look, even if it looks artificial, that's fine, you know. But as long just, as you play into it. But just, yeah, make it look good, you mm. know. Um, <laughs> because that's the problem. They end up looking really flat mm. and static. It's like and... it's two, two guys walking around in front of a green screen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but apparently he's got the rights back to the store to to Repo Man now. So watch out, you might see another Repo Man coming out soon. So yeah, as James said earlier, you've got Harry Dean Stanton as Bud, Emilia Westervez as the lead character called Otto. Um, you have Tracy Walter as Miller, Olivia Barish as Leela, Soli Richardson as Light, Vanetta McGee as Marlene. Uh, Fox Harris as Frank Parnell, mm. uh, a whole bunch of other cast of interesting characters. The one thing you might notice is a lot of the names of the characters, especially the Repo Men, are all named after beers. So you've got Bud, Miller, Light, etc. Mm. But yeah, Harry Dean Stanton is in this film, which I think is nuts. <laughs> but it's not that nuts because you know he's been in one Magic Christmas that me and Liam talked about, you know, a couple of months ago, and. Mm. Um, but he's just an amazing screen presence. I don't know about you. What do you think about Harry Dean Stanton in this film? Uh, I liked him. Um, I always like Harry Dean Stanton. He's a, a very entertaining screen presence. Um, he was the best thing in the Avengers. <laughs> um, <laughs> just one little camera like a janitor. <laughs> just because it was completely un- unexpected. He was like, hey, fucking Harry Dean Stanton. Um, I was expecting, with him having top billing, to have more of a role in it. But um, what what was there was gold. Do you think I? He, it felt to me like the repo men in the film were almost like parental figures for Otto, you know, maybe mm. the rest of his character because you know you see his parents in. I mean, there's only one scene where you see his parents and they're kind of like transfixed on the evangelical guy on the TV, mm. and it, you find out that they've given all away the savings that they were going to give to Otto to this kind of. To this religious guy, or where he's you know, sending whatever. Bibles to Africa, or something yeah, exactly. Like that. So they yeah. send a thousand dollars to him, or whatever. And um, so, yeah, it's, it seems to me like his family now become the the repo men, and you know, the, mm. and the uh, the secretary who works there. So Richards, I think, is the other one who kind of. So you've kind of got two repo men. You've got, kind of got two distinctive styles. So you've got Harry Dean Stanton, who refuses to kind of ever steal a car. Like he'll never literally you know, jacket and kind of, you know, hot wire it or whatever. Mm. But he'll use means like he tricks Emilio Estevez into like driving it at the beginning. He says, you know, this is my wife's car. I need you to drive <laughs> this to follow me to the hospital or whatever. He follows him but ends up in the, uh, the like the courtyard of the repo men where they keep all the repossessed vehicles and stuff. That was um, one of my favorite lines in the film where Emilio uh, Otto is like, uh, what about your old lady? And he's like, oh, shit, I forgot about her. <laughs> well, she'll get the bus. She's she's a rock. 
And then I think the other guy, is it Cy Richardson, I think, who plays the other guy, and he actually like Jack's car, so you know, he's kind of got like the the wire, you know, and, mm. like pulling at the He carries a gun. He carries a gun and stuff. And um is he the one who reads the book that's the it's kind of like the Scientology book? Uh diuretics. Yeah, because there's definitely like a stab at Scientology in this film. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it is. You've kind of got two rival. You've got a, like a rival repo men like team, haven't you? The Rodriguez, Rodriguez brothers. brothers. Yeah, you know, like later on in the film, the secretary from Harry Dean Stanton's like mm. repo men unit. Why is she with them? I, I think it just went completely nuts in like the last twenty minutes. I was, <laughs> I've got that in my notes. The last twenty minutes, everything <laughs> happens. It's yeah, insane. <laughs> It's yeah, just every, everybody's changing sides. All sorts of shit is going down. Um, it's hard to keep track of uh, <laughs> who's doing what. But yeah, I was gonna say, should we should we kind of try and roughly go through the pot because we might remember certain bits. Of <laughs> like apparently, like the intro sequence, you know, like where it's kind of like got the aerial kind of like pro proto like Google Maps kind of thing. Yeah, like the uh, uh, radar type. Apparently that's image. documenting the journey that the car mm. makes. I'm not exactly too sure where it's set. I think it's LA, but I'm not too sure. It's clearly LA, because half, lo- half the locations are used in the Terminator. Yeah, and I think some of them are from um, Back to the Future as well. I'm sh- I swear that tunnel is in Back to the Future. In- uh, it's definitely in the Terminator, yeah. and where they have... Uh, they have the big throwdown with the uh, Rodriguez brothers with the baseball bats. That's uh, in the Terminator as well. That's when he crashes the car, police car into the wall. Yeah, and then isn't that like you know the what, like in Greece and maybe uh, yeah, think the, them as well that we you know we talked and Terminator about. Two, Terminator Two, yeah. That the, kind of, what's, East, it, what's it called? East, El- East LA River, is it? That's it. Yeah, I love that scene actually. But we will get mm. to that later on. So yeah, anyway, <laughs> so you see this kind of like over the head kind of like as I said, proto kind of. Google Maps kind of thing documenting the journey of this car. And then we see like this car razzing through the, the highway and it's being chased by the police. Uh, it gets pulled over and, um, you know, he wants to know what's in the back of the trunk. He opens it up and he gets disintegrated and then he just drives off again. Mm-hmm. And then, then do we then go straight to Otto working in the supermarket? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And then, it looks like he's with Napoleon Dynamite, and like apparently this guy is his friend. But like, look, which you later on, you know, you think they live together or something, or they. Mm. Um, but he's like pretty hostile towards him. <laughs> and um, well, if he spent all day singing jingles yeah. next to me whilst I was working in retail, I'd be pretty hostile as well. Yeah, true. Um, but like the his manager and the security guard are very hostile to him. They pull a gun out <laughs> on him. Like yeah. when they just... knocking somebody into a display. Yeah. So he gets fired from his job. Um and then you kind of see him like in his environment with his like punk mates and stuff like that. But it's almost like he's like not accepted with his punk mates either. He's not he's not punk enough or like not crazy mm. enough or something like that. They're all like all moshing in a car park or whatever and <laughs> and then you see him like uh I tell you what, this film looks great. Like there's the mm. shot where he's sitting on the railroad tracks and um like the skyline looks beautiful. Mm. And... I just love that, like nighttime exterior, eighties LA look, like the Terminator. It just looks really cool. Yeah, and he's like the music's pretty cool. So at this point, you've got um, Black Flag's six pack going, and he's as he's drinking a six pack. Um, mm. And I think before that, have he almost has sex with a girl, or he's got a girlfriend. And he goes to go and get her a beer, and he comes back up, and I think his friend's already fucking. <laughs> so yeah. like, Fuck so that's just he... ignore him; he'll go away. So that's when he leaves, and he's sitting on the railroad tracks, and then he walks off. Then again, and that's when he bumps into Harry Dean Stanton the next day, and he's like conned into like taking this car, and then by accident ends up becoming a repo man. He's like, "I ain't coming no repo man." <laughs> and then the yeah, like second... the repo men have like such a uh, a terrible reputation. Yeah, <laughs> like they're a, a gang that scourges East LA or where <laughs> like well, the repo you, men are coming. I guess you could say this is the weirdest episode of Can't Pay. We'll take it away. <laughs> yeah. I guess it would be a lot more entertaining if it was like this. They were tracking down <laughs> oh, radioactive cars. Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess at this point, 
I mean, it, it constantly cuts back and forth between the guy in the car. Like, just he, it just seems like he's just driving around. Yeah, just, once he's he not, gets to LA, he's just driving around the city. He's yeah, not he's making not really, any actual he's progress. He's not aiming for anywhere in particular. And so then, I mean, he's meant to be meeting up with the girl. Oh, uh, is that Layla. what he's doing? Because he, she's. I mean, got... yeah, because she she makes the phone call. She's That's meant it. to be like uh, tracking the car as well, and she's she makes the phone call to him later on. But I don't know what they were going to do, <laughs> or why he continues to drive after that. So, like, we get like a a couple of scenes where um, Emilio Estevez is being taught the ropes by Harry Dean Stanton, while they're like, I don't know, they're snorting this massive line of speed. <laughs> where like you know he tells him his viewpoints on repo repossessing you know saying he, the repo you know, he code the repo code like he doesn't steal and stuff like that and um you know no damage to the car or possessions within the car yeah they go to bed at three in the morning and then up at four or something like that you know <laughs> um but yeah what proceeds so i guess yeah so he's learning the ropes and you know he's like helping like take cars or steal cars you know he tries to take a few by himself like so he goes to visit that old uh, lady mm. and you know he's you know, talking to her about you know taking a car and stuff and then her oh, son's... i'll have to borrow some money from somewhere <laughs> yeah and then her sons come in and you know it's <laughs> and like... there's like 18 of them and they all file in one by yeah. <laughs> one and sit down in every available seat and then the you know uh they go to take. He goes then, like you know, I'm going to leave now. He goes to take the car, but doesn't realise the car's like kind of jacked up, so it doesn't go anywhere. So then they like beat the shit out of him. Uh, there's also another repo man who's a police officer, so I'm guessing he moonlights as a repo man or something. Is he? I never. You never actually see him doing any repoing. He just kind of sits in the office and knits, just hanging and around. complains when people tell him to fuck off. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I assumed um, he was just meant to be like hired muscle. So yeah, but doesn't actually do anything. Uh, what's the name of the girl? What's her name? Leela. Yeah. So yeah, he's driving. So um, one of the cars that um, he's repossessed. He's like driving around, cruising along, and he meets a the, Emilio Estevez. This is, and he meets a girl called Leela. And I think, you know, he kind of like just shouts at her, doesn't he, from the side of the road mm. and stuff. But because um, she's running. Yeah. And he's like, "Do you want to lift?" Yeah, I guess you could say as well, though, that like it's. You know, it's quite creepy the way he kind of he goes up to her and stuff like that. But like, I think she turns it round on it, mm. so she like redefines the the power exchange between the two of them, so it doesn't come across as. Uh, I think a lot of like come ons in older films come off as creepy now. Yeah, but I think the way that she she acts, she kind mm. of subverts it, so she like spins it around, so she becomes the powerful one in the relationship. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And like you know, as they're driving around, like she bombards him with all this kind of crazy like alien talk, and he's like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> and she pulls out this like photo, which apparently is like of these two aliens that apparently were condoms with stuff just tied on them, <laughs> and they like they're meant to like sausages or something like that. And she goes, "This is gonna make the news." And um, so yeah, what happens after that? Um, it's a whole bunch more of repossessions, and it's it, it's. You've basically covered the entire plot now, and then it just kind of flicks between repossessions, coming back to the alien subplot, who are monitor these feds are monitoring uh, both like the repo uh, people and Layla's organization. What were they called? The Federate uh, Original Fruitcakes Organization, or something. My like favorite that. thing about that is that the, the the main woman of that she's got like a. They keep talking about her robotic hand. Yeah. But she's she just got a silver glove just, on. Yeah, <laughs> It's like a Michael glove. Jackson glove. <laughs> it, it's only because they show a shot of her like with a screwdriver messing around with it. At one point, you realise it's meant to be robotic. I mean, I assume that's down to budget, but I, like, yeah. I, I quite like the fact of how shit it is. <laughs> like, this could be a trauma film, really. Mm. If you just not... If you dial it up a bit with the gore and the kind of... Just the craziness of it. It could be a trauma film, really. I, I was kind of expecting something more along that lines. Um, yeah. Uh, Return, Return of the Living Dead, that kind of really kind of punky well, ethos. But there were so many films around like the the early to mid eighties with punks in it. So, like you said, mm. you've got Return of the Living Dead. You've kind of got like Class of Newcomb High. Even mm. like the punks at the beginning of Terminator with you know um, Bill Paxton, Bill Paxton. And stuff like that and. Uh, you know, even at the end of Weird Science, you know, got the Mad Max stuff going on. There was a load of like, kind of like, I don't know what it was about punks. I don't know if like people feared punks at the time. So, 
Like, I don't know if they're, this film is obviously Pope making fun of them also at the same time, because I think, you know, like how, like, you know, heavy metal in the late 80s was probably feared and then hip hop was feared by like middle mm. class people. Maybe punk was as well. And so like punks were in on that joke because they knew that a lot of what they're singing about was all tongue in cheek anyway. Mm. So I don't think this film was making fun of it. I think uh I don't you think know, it was making considering... fun of it, but it's definitely got its tongue firmly in its cheek. You've kind of got the side story with like Otto's three friends that, you know, eventually become two as, you know, they kind of start robbing places and stuff like that. <laughs> Come on, let's go do crimes. Yeah. <laughs> let's go get sushi and not pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> We've also talked about the two brothers who were from the rival um repo the the rodriguez mm. brothers and there's a whole kind of like weird car chase as we said in that at los angeles what's it called the the la river the river yeah um but they kind of tell them about this car the twenty thousand dollars twenty thousand dollars again like yeah. the, the, battle of the, <laughs> battle bands. Of the bands. um yeah but they kind of tell them about this car so there's almost like an honor amongst them as well they they kind of tell each other about well they initially didn't want to go for it because they they wondered why the price was so high, so and they high. figured it was drugs. And he was like, "Oh, we don't do drugs here." Got you. Okay. Um, but yeah, they, I don't think it was entirely clear whether they were completely uh, at odds with each other, or like you say, whether they were like honor among thieves or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh... apparently there's meant to be a whole like different ending where the kind of. It's more like a militia kind of thing with them because apparently if you look in their apartments, loads of guns everywhere. Yeah. I mean, you do see a bit of gunfire with them later on in the film. But it's a bit shoddily edited together when they're escaping the the hospital or whatever. Like, because that scene doesn't make sense, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> but um, so yeah, Otto meets this girl. They have sex in the car, pretty much, don't they? Which I think she in, instigates. And, yeah, um, and it goes all high spec. It goes sped up, doesn't it? I think the mm. film stock. Um, oh yeah, going back to the... I'm going to be all over the place, sorry, because Liam's not here to kind of rein me in because I'm completely scatterbrained. But like, uh, this was shot on film. It looks amazing. And we were talking about trauma films. I think they were even shot on film as well, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. It was only until very recently they started shooting digital because, I mean, Lloyd Kaufman dipped into his life savings to shoot Poultry Geist because he refused to shoot digital. He wanted to shoot on 35 mil. <laughs> But like, uh, I'm trying to look who the cinematographer of this film was. It was um, Robbie Mulner. So Robbie Mulner also uh, was the cinematographer on Paris, Texas, which is another uh, film with Harry Dean Stanton, in which I love that film. Mm. Um, he also did To Live and Die in L.A. So yeah, he's definitely you know done some great films. So I think him was probably a mediating influence on Harry Dean Stanton because apparently he didn't get along with Alex Cox. Well, I I imagine Harry Dean Stanton's quite a difficult person to get along with <laughs> because apparently, like, he was... I think he didn't want to learn the script and he kind of just wanted to mm. ad-lib his way through it, you know, and he's like, well, I've worked with Francis Ford Coppola, you know, and, whatever, mm. and they let me ad-lib, you know. If they let me ad-lib, I think you should let me ad-lib. And then apparently, you know, obviously he'd sign contracts and stuff like that to say, you know, I'll do this script or whatever. Mm. And Alex Cox was like, well, if you sign this contract, say you're going to do this script, otherwise we'll sue your ass. And apparently <laughs> then he was he was on board from that on. From that on. He crazy. seems like a guy, though, that is kind of like, I'd say a bit like a Bill Murray or a Bruce Willis. Mm. In the fact you get him on you, side and he's, he'll be yeah, your you friend forever. Get, you get, if, he, if he respects you, he will mm. he'll give you his all. To be honest, though, I've never seen a Harry Dean Stanton performance where he doesn't give his all. Like, you know, he's in mm -hmm. Pretty in Pink and stuff like that as well. You know, Alien. Um, Christine. Christine, yeah. You know, he's in loads of great films. Um, mm -hmm. Bill Murray is another one I think always gives a good, good performance. I see a lot of criticism like he's sleepwalking his way through performance but I think that's just his style yeah he, he look, he looks like he's perpetually stunned I mean Bruce Willis definitely sleeps oh through yeah performances I mean I don't think he's done a great one since Looper maybe that's my opinion anyway. yeah he's he stopped giving a fuck a long time ago definitely but yeah this guy uh Rodney Muller the cinematographer he also did uh 24 hour party people I don't know if you've seen that one by Michael Winter. I know of it Steve Coogan yeah, it's the true, true story about the guy who created uh, Factory Records and uh, the mm. Hacienda Nightclub. Yes, it's a good film. So, yeah. I used to work with Lars von Trier as well. 
Yeah, he's done lots of good yeah. stuff. Um, so, yes, it looks very nice. Uh-huh. Uh, where are we at in the story? Yeah, he's had sex with the girl. I think we have some more repo scenes, like he gets shot at and stuff like that. But I think he definitely gets a thrill from being a repo man. Like, it's almost like a cops and robbers kind of thing. You know yeah, I mean, I mean he, uh, he does say at one point uh, how you repo guys, you're all off your fucking nut or something like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he keeps meeting up with this girl now and again um, because obviously he's got information about this car. She's looking for the car. The Fed, this government agency are looking for the car. Um, it's all a bit bananas really, isn't mm. it? <laughs> then the girl gets kidnapped by the feds and she seems to turn court and join the feds and start hunting down uh, Otto and the, the repo guys to try and get information about the yeah. car with them. Well, I guess it's worth pointing out at this point that uh, the car's been stolen by Otto's friends. I think it was just after the scene in the nightclub, I think, mm. where there's a band called the Circle Jerks on stage. Just thought I'd get out of there. <laughs> Uh, there's some really good music in this. You've got Iggy Pop as the theme tune, which is wicked. And you've got Suicidal Tendencies as well. They're in the scene as well. So it's got a good soundtrack. But um, yeah, so they these punks steal the car off. What's his name? The guy who run, I don't know if he's got a name, but he's definitely... Parnell, got, is it? The actor is called uh, Fox Harris. Yeah, so his name's J. Frank Parnell. And he's uh, kind of... He's got sunglasses in, but one of the lenses hasn't got... The, <laughs> the frame hasn't it's got one lens missing hasn't it but um he tries to steal it back uh and they catch him and he's yeah. like oh i guess you haven't looked in the trunk yet i guess you're too scared to look in the trunk yeah and uh, uh one of the punks looks in the trunk and disintegrates and they decide that's when they decide to oh come on let's go do some crimes <laughs> and run away and leave the car back with him which he then continues to drive around aimlessly. But then there's a point where the Rodriguez brothers get the car. <clears throat> ah, yeah, they stole it initially. Yeah, they so they stole it first. Okay, right. Yeah, and then because there's then... a scene where they take it to the to the uh, to the gas station where mm-hmm. Otto's friend from the beginning, the one who looks like Napoleon Dynamite, works, and he calls them babes for some reason. <laughs> really bizarre. I think it's that. Is it that scene? And then it gets yeah. and it gets stolen by the punks then. Mm-hmm. That's it, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, see, so yeah, there's a lot of back and forth between stealing this car and stuff. Because there's definitely then there's a point later on where Emilio Estevez gets it because mm. he chases it down. There's a really cool scene before that though, where he, people are getting getting affected by this car, aren't they? Or the radiation? Mm, yeah, he's walking down the streets and there's uh, people lying around and getting uh, picked up and disposed of by people in radiation suits. Yeah. But apparently in the car, like the car, they say it's really hot and people are, you know, they as they're driving around in the car, they they know there's something wrong with this car because it's it's boiling hot. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, Emilio Estevez finally gets the car because the guy, the guy driving the car eventually kill, dies, doesn't he? Mm. Uh, Emilio Estevez takes it back to the repo, the repo lot. They have a party, don't they, or something like that? Yeah, Miller's house. Yeah. What happens to Bud? Bud, who is uh, Harry Dean Stanton, he gets... He gets angry and just kind of fucks off for a while. Yeah, but I guess he takes the car, doesn't he? Yeah. And then he ends up in hospital somehow. Help me out. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember how he gets... He's got a bandage on his head. Yeah, does he... What happens to him? Does he get shot? Oh, that's what happens. Oh, yeah, it was in the... In so, the yeah. uh... so they go to... Uh... So Bud, <laughs> we're so bad at remember. There's so much weird <laughs> stuff that happens. I literally film. finished watching it about two hours ago. I've watched it twice. <laughs> and so, Did you watch the TV version? Mm, don't think so. Uh, that, I hope not. <laughs> yeah, I think you would notice. Uh, Alex Cox supervised the TV version, and he made, like, he dubbed all this in a kind of... Um, Hot Fuzz, uh, oh, funk kind funky, of way. Funky. Supervised, yeah, Mother Hoppers and Melon Farmers uh, kind of way. And apparently it's a very good watch. Enough so much that they included it on the Blu-ray. <laughs> right, okay. But anyway, <laughs> but yeah. a, so I think they go out to get... So Bud and I go out to get some drinks or something, don't they, from an, like an off-license mm. whatever. But it gets held up by their two friends. 
uh, by Otto's two friends. And there's like a, I, I really like this scene actually, where everyone's mm. pointing guns at each other. And there's a security <laughs> guard from the beginning somehow in there as well. <laughs> and like everyone gets shot apart from Otto. Mm. And um, apparently they weren't allowed to show much blood in the film. Mm. But the way they he got very around wary was, of it. It, yeah. was that he put tomato ketchup bottles everywhere. So they're constantly getting shot. So there's like loads of red stuff going everywhere anyway. So mm. that's how he got around that. That's a good idea. Yeah, definitely. Um, I do like that scene though, where he's, uh, what does his friend say? Like when he gets shot, he, um, he blames society. He blames society. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I'm here, man. The lights are growing dim. I know a life of crime led me to this sorry fate. And yet, I, I blame society. Society made me what I am. That's bullshit. You're a white suburban punk, just like me. But it still hurts. You're gonna be all right, man. Yeah, so then, uh, I think at this point, uh, Otto is kidnapped or he's captured then by the government agency and mm. tortured, which you don't really see much of because he's you only see him on a video t- on his video screen, don't you? As they're yeah. kind of like zapping him, and his girlfriend is, seems to be quite happy to, <laughs> yeah. to like well, as long as we find out where this car is, I'm quite happy torturing. to torture him. Yeah, but then the Rodriguez brother and then the secretary from the 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 repossession yard or whatever they come and rescue him. Is that right? You're not quite sure who. It, yeah, you're not quite sure who it is on the monitor. You just yeah. see people burst in with machine guns, pick then, him up, and then they take leave. him to the hospital. Mm. Um, and take you. We see Harry Dean Stanton in in hospital. I think he's passed out at this point, or he's unconscious. He's watching the uh, evangelical guy on the TV, yeah, and he's kind of transfixed, like his parents were. So there's a lot of talk of like cosmic unconsciousness in the film. Mm. So like one of the characters talks about like, you know, you think of a plate of shrimp, and all of a sudden you see it everywhere. It's like I don't know if that's ever happened to you, mm. but like when I got, when I got the Prodigy video, like everywhere I saw was foxes. Everything I could see was foxes. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So yeah, like, yeah. It's, like, it's almost like the universe is speaking to you. Mm. So it's, it kind of gets a little bit philosophical at that point. But then there's a couple a bit... of scenes after that, you do see a uh, sign in a window for a plate of shrimp. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And then I think, like, um, you know, when Harry Dean Stanton wakes up out of in hospital after they all leave, they talk about the car on the TV. So that kind of like indicates to him, you know, what he needs to do or what he's going to go and do. Um, then I guess there's a bit of a shootout scene in the hospital between the Rodriguez brothers and the and I guess the, the feds. Uh, the feds. Um, yeah, I, I love this though. You see the you see the car drive past them, don't you? And it's like obviously rotoscoped, but it's like yeah. it's now glowing green, like luminous <laughs> green. Um, in a real kind of fifties sci-fi, yeah, <laughs> kind of thing. And then they all make their way back to the the yard. And the car now, like apparently they painted it with like, uh, you know, kind of like in Superman the movie. UV kind of paint, kind of yeah. paint. And uh, it's proper bright. Mm. It looks cool. I mean, even though it's all practical, it does kind of look like a, a rotoscope effect. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? But yeah, it's mm. all practical, as you said. So yeah, and basically, Harry Dean Stanton's in the car. He won't get out. There's helicopters overhead saying, you know. The one thing Harry Dean Stanton said, he goes, I think he says, I'd rather die than steal a car or something like that was he, there's a definite line it's, that foreshadows he says uh, I'd rather die on my feet than kneeling down or something like or that stealing a car or something yeah. there's something like to that effect so they get him out of the car and then you know obviously he gets gunned down so there's you know mm. so that, that feels like a very Edgar Wright kind of thing doesn't it you know like a lot of the foreshadowing and kind of that mm. you know and then Bob the Goon gets inside the <laughs> the car well the, the car is rejecting all these uh, all these oh yeah it's uh, like throwing fences. them away yeah yeah there's like a force field around it because everyone's there now you've kind of got the the holy guys there 
all the feds and all kinds of different people. Yeah, and it's it's kind of jutting out. It's jutting out like electricity at everyone. Sets yeah. a guy on fire, bursts a Bible into flames, but then... There's a good line with that bit, actually. There's a lot of good lines in this film, actually. Mm. So, um... Is the line the preacher says? Yeah, this preacher goes, holy sheep shit, and then the Bible <laughs> gets set on But there are some other great lines in this. So, mm. like, uh, one of the early lines in the film, are, um, it happens sometimes. People just explode. Natural causes. <laughs> Natural causes. Um, and then, like... Uh, Harry Dean Stanton's character calls everyone dildos all the time. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is an underrated word, I think. Yeah, it's like, have you seen uh, the, uh, the Weatherman with Nicolas Cage? No. Yeah, he calls people dildos in there as well. It's <laughs> pretty good. Oh, yeah, we forgot to mention the ice cubes as well. There's like, it's hailing oh, ice yeah. cubes. And you can just tell that someone's just off screen. just like, Yeah, literally just tipping. Just <laughs> tipping. <laughs> but yeah, so as we said, uh, Bob the Goon's in the car and then he tempts... Otto in the car, and then they just f- f- fly away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the end? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah? I mean, I, th- I actually really like this film, though. Mm. It's it's a weird watch, but it is all the characters are highly enjoyable to watch. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Like 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 you said, I wasn't sure. I, like, I, I thought maybe it may go... I don't know if it's... Sh- like, I... I'm having this thing with all these 80s films we've watched so far. Like, you know, we watched... Um, what was the first one we all watched together? Altered States. Altered States, where I wish that kind of went further. Mm. Um, you know, we watched uh, Streets of Fire. I wish that went further, you know, a bit more violent, had more music mm. and stuff like that. Like, I don't know about this one. Like, I don't know if, if they went further. It would kind of take away from it. Like, it would kind of... Because obviously there's lots of social satire and commentary in this. I don't know if mm. like if they kind of went too over the top with it or kind of. It's definitely out there. It's definitely out there. I mean, mm. it's of a piece. It's in its own little world. Mm. But I think it's it could on your DVD Blu-ray shelf. It could sit alongside a trauma, but then on the other hand, you know, I don't know, next to like RoboCop or Brazil, you know, kind of films that are a bit more satirical and a bit more of a social commentary. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd say it's got my, like a street trash vibe. I definitely got a street trash vibe, definitely. Mm. But not as cheap. Yeah. It definitely feels like some effort or thought was put into this. And, um, you know, it's, it's got a good script. It's very sharp. Mm. Um, you, know, you, you know, you don't just get the likes of Harry's Dean Stanton in a film like that do you like in street trash you know they're all kind of like, <laughs> you know you know well, how good would that be i know imagine <laughs> it's one of the one of the homeless people yeah, like the, turning yeah. to blobs or just uh playing catch with somebody's severed dick <laughs> who was the guy in that in uh street trash who kind of like rules the trash trash yard there just seems to be these three people who just live in the trash yard I can't remember the details. I haven't <laughs> seen like it in about 10 years. Yeah, um, and when I watched it, it was the secret movie in an all-night horathon. It was started playing at like 4 in the morning, so I was already pretty fucked when it started. Um, but that's I, the ideal time to watch it, really. But it's like I told you, I went to HMV the other day, and I I don't know why it was, but I was in the I was in the horror section. It's not the horror section. It's like the boutique label section. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you've got like eight eight films and one oh one films and uh all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah. so I saw Body Melt, which I've never seen in my life before, never even heard mm. of, but I saw the I, I've of known of Bishop it. and I was like yeah. getting this. Um <laughs> I've known of it since it came out, like ninety three. You know, I picked um, I picked up uh, Toxic Avenger Part Two, I've never seen that one. Uh Sorority Babes, uh in the slime bowl bowl of armor. Um, class of 1984, Inframan, The New Kids, Brain Dead. Uh, I got this other. Not this... the uh, not the Peter Jackson Brain Dead. No, though. no, that's the reason why I think it has to be called Dead Alive in America, isn't it? I think. Quite possibly. That new that other one does intrigue me. Is it uh, Bill Pullman? Bill Pullman, Bill Paxton, Double Bill. Oh, together at last. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, got Born of Fire, which is like a British and I think an Israeli horror film. I don't know if it's like an art house horror film, but the, mm. I just love the look of the cover. Uh, surf, ninja, surf Nazis Must Die. <laughs> just bought loads of schlock. I have no idea if any of these films are any good, but we'll find out. 
but yeah anyway so what are your final thoughts on uh repo man i i liked it highly recommend it yeah i um, what would you give it out of five uh four i think yeah i'm with you oh, i'd give it a four i think yeah i mean yeah like it definitely had a bit of a i wouldn't say hunter s thompson vibe but it definitely felt quite gonzo like do you know what i mean like, yeah yeah a lot of people driving around cars like mm. quite jacked up not jack like not jacked up in the sense of like they're all roid or whatever but they're all kind of intense mm. and stuff like that you know yeah yeah but yeah like so much happens in the last 20 minutes you're like what, what now <laughs> what now what's going on who's this yeah it just kind of overwhelms you yeah but highly recommended i really enjoyed it it's really funny it, you, you don't you don't know where it's gonna go you know keeps you on your toes Mm. Yeah, highly recommended. Everybody's just very entertaining to watch. Even without the radioactive car, you know, you could watch a film with just these guys running around. Oh, yeah, definitely. Cars. So with that then, I guess that all that wraps it up. Yeah. yeah I, I apologise if I just completely rambled through that. But this <laughs> film is really hard to talk about because it's so many different things. Mm. And lots of things happen and... I've seen it twice and I literally cannot remember what order things happen in because there's <laughs> yeah. so much stuff. There's no real structure to it. It's basically just a series of kind of happenings until it all hits the fan, like 20 minutes from the end. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> well, anyway, thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for joining me today. Thank you, not a problem. No. Um, yeah, and please come back next week because Liam will be back and we're going to be talking about the Agnes Varda film uh, Vagabond, so I'm very much looking forward to that. So yeah. Uh, is there anything you want to pimp before you we go? No, nothing new on the horizon at the moment. Uh, my website's untamedaggression.com uh, and the new film, head to popping.com. Where else can they find you on the socials? Uh, they've all got different addresses because I'm a douchebag, but all the links are on the website. Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> it's usually like Untamed Aggression, isn't it? Yeah. Or something, a variation. Some, oh, yeah, it's, or UA. Every time I try, I try and tag you on Facebook in something, I always forget that you're not under your own name. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I've got two uh, accounts on Twitter. I've got my personal one and I've got the Untamed Aggression right, yeah. account, which I rarely use because I've rarely got anything going on. Yeah, same. I just use my, my personal yeah. one. Now. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, anyway, again, thanks for joining us. Or Thank joining you. me. I keep saying us. <laughs> it's just me today. Isn't it? What, what the it's Royal like? Us. The Royal Us, yeah. Anyway, uh, thanks for listening and please don't forget to rate, review and subscribe. You know, be that on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, wherever you listen to us, that'd be great. Um, you can reach out to us on Twitter. We are at Adjust Your Track. That's with a YR, not a your. And please don't forget, if the picture's bad, always adjust your tracking. <laughs>